Welcome to this edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery, brought to you by spiritualteachers.org. I'm your host, Sean Nevins. Welcome to Journals of Spiritual Discovery. We're up to 88 reviews on Amazon for my book, Subtraction, The Simple Math of Enlightenment. The goal is to reach 100 by April 28th, so we're getting close, but I need your help to make it. Please take three or four minutes and go to Amazon, type in Subtraction, The Simple Math of Enlightenment, and leave a review. You can leave a review even if you don't purchase the book on Amazon. And to all of those friends, acquaintances, and people who don't even know me, except as a voice on this podcast, who've taken the time to leave a review, thank you. You are a blessing. This month's episode is a continuation of the induction series, in which my aim is to focus on writings which carry a message beneath the words. I always like Franklin Merrill Wolf's description of these mystic writings. He said, When the voice of the silence speaks into the relative world, the meaning lies between the words, as it were, rather than in the direct content of the words themselves. Richard Rose referred to the power of these types of writings when he said, If you are interested in looking for essence, from the point of the process observer, you can be stimulated only by writings of inspiration rather than reason or direction. He referred his students to his The Three Books of the Absolute as an example. While Rose used the term inspirational, clearly these are not necessarily inspirational writings like you typically find collected under that banner. Rather, they are writings which carry the living word. My reading this episode is an excerpt from my book where I describe the moments that led up to my enlightenment experience. It occurred as I was reading a transcript of Franklin Merrill Wolf's induction talk. So this reading is a mix of my words and quotes from Merrill Wolf's talk. I've added a few extra quotes from the induction paper that appeared in the original book. But if you want to hear Merrill Wolf's talk in full, I included a link to the original audio recording in the show notes. Just go to spiritualteachers.org forward slash podcast. Here's my recounting of the evening a package of Merrill Wolf's transcripts arrived in the mail. Excitedly opening it, I settled into reading the transcript of a talk titled The Induction. Alone in my apartment on a Tuesday evening, Merrill Wolf's long dead words came alive and forever changed my life. Let's start a little analysis, Merrill Wolf began like a friend stepping beside me to share some playful thought. He began a self-analysis, a deconstruction of the self, actually, first addressing the body. He said, So we come to the first stage of self-analysis. It runs generally this way. I ask, What am I? And first it occurs to me, that the idea that I am this body is a delusion, because this body is an object before my consciousness. I speak as though it were my body. I speak as though I possess it. It is therefore external to me. I am not the body. I agreed with this. What I saw was not me. The view was not the viewer. Next, Merrill Wolf addressed the roaring rage of our feelings. And then we come to dealing with our vital nature, our feelings. We get into a roaring rage. We fall in love. We are delighted with the beauties of a symphony and strongly reach out toward it. Are those feelings of I? No. For I experience them. I but experience them. They're different from me. I can't identify them and name them, and that itself is enough proof that they are not I. I agreed again. I saw my feelings as a thing apart, occurring outside of my sense of I-ness. I had noticed this for many years. 
Next, he broached the thought. Now, are you ready? he asked. I'm very deliberately violating the rules of grammar, for the I of which I speak is never an object, never a me. You can't write these things and be grammatically correct. Am I this body of thoughts in my mind? No. One gets a little closer to his thoughts than to anything else, and it's a little harder to untangle this. But, if he watches and studies closely enough, the thoughts come to me. This, too, I saw occurring time and again in meditation, thoughts entering my mind without effort on my part. Having dissected the body, feelings, and thoughts, Merrill Wolf pointed to the last bastion of identity. He said, I'm not the mind, I'm not the feelings, I'm not the body that I see, but I surely am, I surely am an individual apart from others. What he was naming was my sense of identity, the sense I existed in this world. He said, now what you've gotten a hold of is a very difficult fellow, it's your ego, he can sneak around and confuse you like the Dickens. You can spend years trying to get behind him, which I had. My meditations tried and tried to see beyond this black wall in my mind. And what you do, he said, you can get into an infinite regression. You look at your ego. All right, here am I. And all of a sudden it dawns upon you that which is looking at the ego is really the I. So you stick that one out in front. You look at it again, but then you realize it couldn't be, because here is a something that is observable. I knew exactly what he meant. The infinite regression, my mind spinning round and round, the noting of noting of Vipassama meditation, awareness watching awareness, and finding no resolution to this conundrum. And then he said, At last it finally dawns that I am that which is never an object before consciousness. And mayhap at that moment in your analysis, the heavens will open. As these words entered my mind, the room filled with energy, like rapport, like that long ago moment by the student center under the pine trees, but with the intensity of an engulfing flame. Tears erupted, poured down my face, and obscured the room. Merrill Wolf's words were true, literally, physically true. I, Sean, was ever an object and ever a thing destined to die. It was obvious and undeniable that I was and always would be doomed to die. In the face of that stark realization, I felt myself fading away, but there was no fight. I did not run from death because there was nowhere to run. The runner himself was vanishing. And as that happened, something became startlingly clear. The nothingness that I was fading into and had so feared was already inside me. Outside and inside were fundamentally the same. How could this be? How could there be only one thing? No observer, no observed, just one. This implosive realization gripped my head like a vice and 
forced me to the floor. I was being consumed by something too vast for the mind to hold. I felt I was dying, but I was not afraid. Two or three times the pain lessened, and I climbed back into the chair, but it came again, and again I fell to the floor. Lines from Richard Rose's Three Books of the Absolute appeared in my mind. O eternal spaces, art thou black or white? Is thy form clothed in light or darkness? Over and over I answered, No, no, it is. There is not black or white. The mind could not contain the merging of two into one, and the gut-level crushing feeling that one is equivalent to none. With no observer, there was nothing to observe and nothing to be observed. The feeling was of slipping into darkness, losing all I had held to so tightly, losing words, images, thoughts, and feeling going to sleep, yet finding I was still awake, but not as an I. Instead, there existed only the still, silent blackness that is sleep, a blackness that was motionless, yet vibrant, dark, yet shimmering, silent, yet vibrating, dead, yet potent. Suddenly, the agony culminated. No words remained, only this. Silence in a space without bounds, a self with no container, containing nothing, contained by nothing. Thank you for listening. I do have one special request during the induction series. And no, I'm not going to ask you to buy anything, but I am asking all my listeners to please leave a review on Amazon for my book, Subtraction, The Simple Math of Enlightenment. I know that a lot of you have read it, and if we can get a hundred reviews on Amazon, I'm told that will really help the book stand out and get noticed. So if you enjoyed Subtraction, please go to Amazon.com, type in subtraction, the simple math of enlightenment, and leave a review. It only takes a few minutes, and you'll help many other seekers simply by giving your thoughts about the book. You don't have to have purchased the book on Amazon in order to leave a review there. So thanks, I hope you can do that for me, and I will see you again on the next episode.